Okay, can you can we be can we hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, first, thank you very much to Wesley Wenten, Francis Wang, and Scott Oshiro for the lovely opening music, Asado Yayunta, which is a, a very famous song in Okinawa for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the Okinawa Memory Initiatives Reflections on the 50th anniversary of the Koza Uprising. I'm Alan Christie, director of the Okinawa Memories Initiative and an associate professor in the Department of History 
at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Nihongo no Bijida ni Taiste, Kono webinar niwa, Tsuyaku no Sentaku ga dekimasu. Zoom no Mado no menu bar ni interpretation to you icon ni click suleba, Nihongo ga erabe daremasu. You can choose the um, interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Hi everyone, I'm Lex. I'm a third year in the PhD um, program in history here, and I study Okinawan Ryukyu in history. And I am super excited and honored to be allowed to read the land acknowledgement. The University of California, Santa Cruz is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and to heal from historical trauma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lex. Uh, our guests will be speaking in either English or Japanese. The program is available with simultaneous interpretation in either language. To choose your preferred language, locate the interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. Click on it and choose your language. When the speakers are speaking the language you have chosen, you will hear them directly. When they're speaking the language you, with, for which you need interpretation, you will hear just our interpreters. We are so happy to be able to provide our audience with a comfortable access to today's program. Events like this don't just fall into place. Instead, many people have done wonderful work to make this possible, and I'd like to begin with some thank yous. Thank you to the special events team at UC Santa Cruz uh, for all the technical and planning support they provided prior to and during this event. Thank you to the Humanities Institute at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where the Okinawa Memories Initiative has its home and administrative support. The Humanities Institute is a wonderful place to incubate new uh, ideas for new projects and events, and we have benefited from their strong support for many years. Thank you to the Tokyo Broadcasting System, TBS, which has given us permission to include one of their talents, Kubota Tomoko, in tonight's events. And while I am at it, let me acknowledge that this event was first proposed to us by Kubota-san, whose participation in Okinawa Memories Initiative research fieldwork over the last couple of years has been a tremendous gift. Thank you to the wonderful undergraduate students who staff the events and communications team, uh, who have worked hard to develop this event and communicate about it through our social media. Edie Troutwine, Kimberly Zito, Emily Aranda, Jared Guzman, and Mickey Arlen. And thank you as well to team members Drew Richardson and Marcy Flynn for shooting and editing video of the neighborhood in Koza as it is today. Thank you to our guests, Kuniyoshi Kazuo, Stan Rushworth, and Wesley Wenten for giving us your time and insights. And thank you to Chio Mori and Miki Watanabe for their interpretation work today. Thanks as always to the people of Okinawa and the United States who have shared their time and their stories with us. We're honored to serve our communities. And finally, thank you to all of you who have joined us today and especially those who have shared our announcements and have thereby helped us reach as wide an audience as possible. As director of this project, I am humbled by the support and so grateful to you all. And one last thing before we get started, our event is presented in the webinar format of Zoom. That means that you, our guests, will not be visible on our screens and the chat feature of Zoom is disabled. We welcome any questions you have for our question and answer period at the end of our presentations. To submit a question, either in English or in Japanese, please use the Q&A function visible at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We are recording this event and we'll make it available on our website at okinawamemories.org. 
So our program will feature three conversations between a member of the Okinawa Memories Initiative team and a special guest. We will begin with a conversation between Kubota Tomoko and Kuniyoshi Kazuo. Mr. Kuniyoshi worked for many years as a photographer for the Ryukyu Shinpo, one of the major newspapers in Okinawa. The night of the Koza uprising, he was called out by his editors to document what was going on. He will talk with us about conditions in Okinawa prior to the events of December 20th, 1970, to help us understand the sources of the anger that erupted that night, give us his eyewitness account, and talk about the legacies of the uprising in Okinawa. Our second conversation will be between Dr. Dustin Wright, Associate Director of the Okinawa Memories Initiative, an assistant professor in the School of World Languages and Cultures at California State University, Monterey Bay, and Stan Rushworth, an American Army veteran, memoirist, and writing teacher at Cabrillo College here in Santa Cruz County. Mr. Rushworth will talk about his, his experiences as a soldier stationed in Okinawa during the Vietnam War. Finally, Alexis McClellan Uvabuscu, a PhD student in history at Santa, UC Santa Cruz, We'll speak with Dr. Wesley Wenten, professor in the Asian American Studies Department at San Francisco State University and former president of the Okinawa Association of America in Northern California. They will speak about the legacy and meanings of the Koza uprising for Okinawans in diaspora and offer commentary for thinking about the Koza uprising in the present context of race relations and protest in the United States. Following these presentations, we will have a Q&A period for the audience to ask our guests any questions you have. And with that, I'll set the stage with a brief account of the late night to early morning of December 20th, 1970 in Okinawa in the middle of the Vietnam American War. 50 years ago today, the often rocky relationship between Okinawans and the US military took a major blow as an Okinawan protest turned violent for the first time in the 25 years of American control of the islands. The protest came to be known as the Koza Riot. We, however, will call it the Koza Uprising, following Okinawan scholars such as Anya Masaaki and our own guest, Wesley Wenten. Calling it an uprising focuses our attention on the political conditions that drove the protesters to violence. The protest was sparked by an accident. An American driving drunk hit an Okinawan man who was walking across the street at about 1 a.m. in the city of Koza. Koza was a busy entertainment and shopping district that especially catered to servicemen and their families living on the bases surrounding the area. Since the accident took place just after Saturday, Saturday night turned into Sunday morning, the streets were still alive with people, even at that late hour. The pedestrian was hurt, although not severely, and a crowd quickly formed at the scene of the accident and grew increasingly agitated as police and then MPs arrived to investigate. Just one week earlier, another American who had killed an Okinawan woman in a drunk driving incident in the town of Itoman had been let off by a military court and removed from the island. With that fresh evidence of the unaccountability of the American military, the crowd in Koza was determined not to let this accident follow the same path. As anger boiled over, people stopped passing cars driven by Americans, removed and often beat their passengers. Through the rest of the night, they flipped and burned cars parked on the side of the road or in nearby parking lots. Staff working in the area's bars offered Coke and beer bottles filled with gasoline from a nearby gas station as Molotov cocktails. Eventually, thousands of protesters faced off against hundreds of police and MPs. They moved through the major streets of Koza, carefully designating the objects of their wrath by virtue of the fact that license plates differentiated between American and Okinawan owners. One group even stormed Gate 2 of Kadena Air Base, burning a couple of buildings there. In the end, over 60 cars were burned, and dozens of people were injured and arrested. And thankfully, there were no deaths. The next day, a couple of American newspapers reported on what authorities were calling the riots, but coverage quickly disappeared from American newspapers. However, the absence of, me of media uh, in the media of further reporting on the uprising does not mean that it was insignificant or merely momentary. 
This was an event that was in some ways spontaneous, and in another, the explosion of long smoldering embers. Many things contributed to this night of rage, and our guests will all talk to, the, to those uh, issues. And with that long introduction, I would like to now turn the program over to Kubota Tomoko and Kunio Shikazo, who will speak to us from uh, Okinawa ah, in Koza. Hi, arigatou gozaimasu. Hi, everyone. Can you see this? Not yet. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Tomoko Kubota, December 20th. Right now, it's uh, 8, um, 9, 48, 45, 9, 50 a.m. in Japan. This is Koza in Okinawa Prefecture in Japan. It's really quiet uh, 50 years ago around this time. There were a lot of cars, a lot of people in the same area. So I'm going to talk to somebody who actually I witnessed the event 50 years ago, and then I'm going to walk around the area to introduce the area for you. So this is um, Kuniyoshi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, nice to meet you. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, Kuniyoshi-san's um, background quickly. I'd like a slide, please. Well, Ms. Uh, Mr. Kuniyoshi was the photojournalist for uh, Ryukyu Shinpo. He is a, still a photojournalist. So um, when Koza uprising um, occurred, he ran to the area and then took pictures. So for this part, um, back then, uh, he's going to talk about how things were back in Okinawa. Um, so let's um, see if we can visually, virtually experience the little walk in the town of Koza. So this is Kuniyoshi. So right now where I'm sitting is um, by the uh, number two gate um, of the Cadena Air Force Base, U.S. Air Force Base. And I'm sitting in history. This is the uh, second gate right here. And then this um, wide road here, that is called Gate Street. And the Koza uprising actually spread to this area as well. And then so I'm, I'm hoping we can take a little stroll here on the Gate Street. So here right now, coming out from the second gate, and then we're on the left side of the gate street. So here, 50 years ago, how was it around here? So the buildings are about the same. It looks the same, but there were a lot of um, signs in English back then. And then, like in the in, even in the mornings, um, you would see a lot of uh, U.S. soldiers walking around here down the street. And 50 years ago, um, December 20th, they had Christmas vacations, and then some people, most people, got about one week, but um, for some people got like one month, one full month of Christmas vacation. And then I think 20th was probably one of the first days of their uh, long vacation. And from each store, you could see all the Christmas songs, uh, carols, like uh, White Christmas, Jingle Bells. And then you can see Christmas decorations. And then I can still picture that night, people walking down the street with those Christmas decorations, local people, US um, soldiers, like, and then you can see, we will continue um, on with the next uh, slide. The photo, uh, there's a boy on the car. 
So this picture. So this is one of my favorites. For sure. So after the uprising, maybe after about 10 hours, this was the next morning. And then the um, U.S. Um, soldiers actually put all the burnt cars in one place. And then a lot of people actually came to see the situation. So back then, um, Koza City, not Okinawa City, but uh, back then, Koza City, became really famous uh, with this uh, news. And that boy you saw, he just kind of hopped on the hood of the car. And then he had maybe one or two steps on the car and then jumped off right away. So all these cars with US license plates and a boy standing on top of one car. That was very symbolic. So he must be, he was probably like eight years old back then. So he must have been like 58, 59, maybe just before 60 right now by then. So you, I can see Banzai here on the car. And then, so feels like this symbolizes this sort of like a clear sort of a refreshing feeling of the local people in Okinawa in this word, Banzai. And then in the morning, there were a lot of people gathered around the scene. So this uprising, so in Okinawan language, it was a well done, good job. There was a word for it to describe this event. And then the local people in Okinawa had been suffering from all these mistreatment, all these traffic accidents being sort of brushed under the rug. Nobody's been punished. I think this riot, this um, uprising actually helped them feel a little bit better about their identity, their local ideas. So this, there are two aspects, I think, in, in the background leading um, to this uprise. And then if you see this, there are several incidents leading up to this Koza uprising. So the first one is the uh, nerve gas not being removed as promised. And this gas was um, prepared and stored in Okinawa for Vietnam. And also um, military crimes uh, by the uh, US um, Army soldiers, uh, US um, Air Force um, soldiers, they were, they would cause some uh, troubles or um, commit crimes, but they weren't punished for what they did. So the Kagoshima Prefecture Satsuma Um, came to Okinawa and they um, keep it um, under control before the World War II. And then in 1945, in April, US military landed Okinawa. And then that included Iwo Jima as well. And then that was the land fight. And then Okinawa is the only place where uh, citizens civilians were involved in the war. So with the US military invasion into Okinawa, they kept Okinawa, entire Okinawa area under control, military control. 
So Okinawa experienced invasion into Ryukyu Kingdom in the 1600s. And then they had other types of invasion throughout the history. And then when you add up all the time, they were um, under some uh, type of control or military control. It's, it's a long, long history, long time that they, um, the local people suffered. So I think all these history or historical background actually led to the Koza uprising. So here there's the uh, delegate from Japan and the US and then also a representative of the Okinawa uh, government or Ryukyu government back then. And so you can see these three men here with different aims, different missions. But uh, uh, Kunio-san repeatedly actually says that there was this serious issue of uh, human rights violation in this area. Yes, um, you can see uh, Mr. Sakase here. And to the left, Mr. Uh, Yara Chobyo, he was the, um, the Ryukyu, the representative of the Ryukyu. And the the man in the middle is uh, James Rampert uh, from the States. And to the right is the um, delegate, a Japanese delegate, Mr. Takase. So then three men are looking at different, you know, different way, different directions completely. And then they have different missions, different agenda. They're not on the same page. And then people in Okinawa in this area protested that US military is um, storing poison gas or nerve gas um, that they were uh, planning to use in Vietnam War. And then they were hiding the fact they were storing those gas from local people. And then I took some pictures um, on this picture without thinking much, but then this was the first day actually um, in 1971 that they were actually transporting the uh, poison uh, gas, nerve gas. And then they, he, uh, Lampert, Mr. Lampert actually said, it described Okinawa as a jungle, and then they have to follow a jungle rule. And then there was a uh, uprising or riot in Vietnam, similar to what happened in Koza. And then with this uh, nerve gas incident, this, this, so this picture is related to the, um, the transportation of the nerve gas. And then I took some uh, like a different pictures on the same day, but some other pictures actually in those pictures, these three men are smiling. Um, so that was kind of um, strange. So then background of this Koza uprising. So um, we were sort of looking at the background, the history leading to this in incident. And then now we would like to talk about what Kuniyoshi san actually saw on that day of the uprising. So sorry, uh, Kubota san, I can't hear you right now. Can you hear me? Alan, can you hear me? I, we, we can hear you, Tomoko-san. Uh, okay, is okay, okay, yeah. yeah, go ahead, uh, Dustin and Stan, uh, go ahead and... Uh... 
start talking for us. Okay, I just need someone to activate my video. I can't seem to do it. Ah, okay. Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Nihonni iru minasan, ohayo gozaimasu. My name is Dustin Wright, and I'm an associate director of OMI and an assistant professor of Japanese culture and language at California State University, Monterey, Monterey Bay. It is my pleasure to welcome to this event my good friend, Stan Rushworth. Stan was born during World War II and served in the military in Okinawa during the early years of the Vietnam War. He has lived and worked in Highland, Guatemala, Hawaii, and has been teaching English in Northern California for the last 30 years with a focus on indigenous issues. He is the author of Sam Wood's American Healing, Going to Water, The Journal of Beginning Rain, and most recently, Diaspora's Children, which just came out this fall. He is a citizen of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, is married, and is a grandfather. So Stan, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much, it's great to see you. Um, Stan, if you don't mind, I wanna begin by first reading a couple of sentences, again, from, from your new book that just came out, Diaspora's Children. Um, just a couple of sentences in your acknowledgments. So Stan writes, I also owe much gratitude to the people of Okinawa who took me in during a very hard time for all. They taught me about compassion, strength, resilience, and the deeper nature of shelter within indigenous thought. Stan, I, just as a way to begin to talk about your experience, I wanted to ask why it was important for you to include that in your acknowledgments. Uh, the book deals uh, a great deal with my time on Okinawa. And I was brought up in early childhood in my grandfather's indigenous household and then was influenced uh, as far away from that as the American educational institutions could bring me uh, because indigenous thought here was quite frowned upon uh, to say the least. Uh, my grandfather's people were a colonized people. And so his way of life, our way of life was not given the respect that uh, it gave itself. So that all culminated for me when I arrived in Okinawa as a teenager in the military in August of 1963. And all of what was happening on a global scale at that time, I think really speaks a lot to what was happening on Okinawa between the military, US military and uh, the Okinawan people. So I think it's, a, you know, in thinking about this event, you know, what I ran into when I got to Okinawa was an incredible amount of fear and fear uh, has a nasty little brother called anger. And that anger creates hatred and creates dehumanization. All of those were very much what I ran into. Um, I had come out of being on a missile site in San Francisco uh, in Pacifica where during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, we were running armed patrols in the artichoke fields of San Francisco. Not too many people know this, but that's what was happening. Uh, the communist uh, fear, the fear of communism, the Cold War, all of that was culminating and heading towards this conflict in Vietnam. So, and I, I think it's also important to realize that all of this is happening before Martin Luther King is happening uh, uh, really in a deep sense of racism 
being completely part of the society. In the military, racism and sexism, uh, the cadence, the military cadence songs were all sexist to say the least, uh, crude, crudely sexist. Uh, when I got to Okinawa, even before that, there was so much segregation between blacks and uh, whites and other people of color. People of color besides blacks were always uh, with the whites in terms of barracks who was sleeping uh, in what section of the barracks and the blacks were always segmented off. So all the racial epithets that you can imagine, the N word, the, this word, the, that word for every ethnicity were just commonplace, as well as the denigration of women, which is in my experience, always part of a colonial uh, dynamic. You know, whenever you have people that feel they're the conquering heroes, they always seem to fall to taking uh, rights over women's lives. And that was very much present in Okinawa. Uh, the first week I was there, um, we were sleeping in our barracks. I was on uh, Sukidon and we were sleeping in our barracks because of race wars between black and white soldiers. We had our lights on all night long with an armed guard with a 45 caliber submachine gun uh, guarding over us all night long. This was from the first night I arrived on the island. They're guarding uh, you from guarding, they're basically uh, guarding some soldiers from other soldiers. Blacks and whites, that's correct. And we were told that a number of people had been killed. I've never been able to find any evidence of that, but that's what we were told. I still remember the face on the young man uh, there sweating all night long, you know, holding this, this 45 caliber submachine gun. So this kind of terror really was part and parcel of everything that was going on. The, um, uh, the impunity that was happening that was uh, that Tomoko mentioned uh, and it, uh, Mr. Kuniyoshi mentioned, the violence against uh, Okinawan women particularly uh, that, was gone, that went without any kind of punishment, uh, very often without any kind of notice whatsoever. And I think a lot of women uh, were hurt who never even stepped forward because they didn't feel that it would go anywhere, you know, and that it would cause a lot of problems in their life. Um, there was a lot of uh, reprisal at the time, right outside of Sukaran, uh, there was um, a, uh, a couple of soldiers uh, right after I got there were attacked by Okinawans is the way it was put. And one of them ended up dead, the other near dead. And, you know, after what I began to see, I'm sure this was in reprisal for some kind of violence uh, against uh, Okinawan women or against Okinawan men. I saw this over and over and over again. Um, in Naha, uh, I was in a hotel one night and the uh, hotel owners roused me in the middle of the night and told me to get the heck out of there because a mob of people came in. I hesitate to use the word mob because it has bad connotations, but a group, a large group of men came in looking for American soldiers to beat within an inch of their life. And uh, I ran out the back door and they chased me down the street and I ran for my life. Same thing happened to me in Nago. I was up there in a Rio Khan and there was an incident I heard later between some Marines and an Okinawa and, and his wife who was accosted by some Marines the Okinawan man stood up, he was beaten very badly, 
and uh, so a group of men came through every place in Nago to beat up American soldiers. The people at the Rio Khan, I knew because I'd been there before, and they hid me in a in a closet and covered me with blankets and probably 20, 30 guys went by with their feet inches away from my face under the blanket. So I'm sure those folks saved my life or saved me from a very severe beating. So this was, this was, this was a constant uh, throughout the time that I was there. And when you look at this from a global perspective, I think you have to take into consideration, again, this is pre-civil rights movement. Uh, this is during a time of intense fear. It's also a time I entered the military only 17 years after the end of World War II. So the whole kind of notion of having stopped Imperial Japan, I think was in a lot of a lot of young soldiers' minds. Of, I know my father fought at Rabaul in the South Pacific. So a lot of our parents had stood up against an empire in Asia, right? And for a lot of native soldiers, uh, indigenous soldiers, we were struggling with the fact that the empire at home was still stifling and oppressing our communities. So this is a really, really difficult thing. So I thank the Okinawan people for uh, reminding me of the shelter in, in, in indigenous thought, indigenous perspectives because that's what they did. I was there from uh, August of 63 until April of 65 in uh, Sukiran, most of that, and then on a special forces staging out area in the north, uh, right so, on the other side of the island from Nago. So that's a, a you know, a pretty, for folks who aren't familiar, that's a pretty big spread of the main island of Okinawa. That's that's you were stationed down in in the south where most of the bases are are concentrated. Um, but then you were also up in the north in that sort of northern, what at the time was a northern jungle training area, right? Yeah. And I I was fortunate while I was stationed in Sukidon well, when I saw how crazy everything was and, and so much violence between the soldiers and, and the soldiers and the local folks, uh, my duty was such that I was able to rent a home in Kozak. So I lived in Kozak uh, with a family, uh, a school teacher and his wife and, and two little girls uh, right on the edge of Kozak. So it was very interesting for me to see the pictures tonight because when I was there in 1964, it was even more different than the pictures that we saw tonight. It was uh, far less clubs and that kind of thing. It was much more of a, uh, of a town, I'd say. Uh, I practiced martial arts there on the side street in Koza with uh, a man named Eizo Shimabuku and um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Naha. Uh, I, I had to get away from the military. So I started learning Japanese, uh, again, practicing martial arts, uh, going into the off limits areas in uh, Naha. There was a great, uh, back then there were these um, music parlors where you could go in and get coffee. There may still be. There was one on Koksayori, kind of downstairs. And I made friends with all the folks there. They were wonderful folks. And I, I, I wanted to thank in writing this book, because so much of it happens on Okinawa, uh, as a confrontation with notions of empire or imperialism and domination, and how that ties domination of the other, domination of someone who's 
country you feel the right to go into because of your superior civilization or whatever, how that involves women, how that, uh, what sub the nature of subjugation really is what the book is about and how, and my experience with resisting that. Well, I could not have done that. I could not have survived the despair of that time. And of course, all of us were being uh, nurtured to go into Vietnam also. And even though we were not officially in there, we were bombing Vietnam from, from there uh, pretty much daily. Uh, special Forces camp I was on, there were A teams and B teams going in and out all the time that were reporting what was happening, which was that Americans were getting beaten very badly at that time. So all of this fear, I think, just created this incredible tension in the soldiers, which of course then they worked out on the local people. Uh, that's what happens you know, in those kind of situations. So, you know, the family I lived with took good care of me. Uh, the folks at the music parlor, did, I spent a lot of time walking by myself, staying away from the soldiers. So I was in a lot of really small villages. I walked from where I was up the north up to Hedo. Uh, I met some children. The children were fantastic. Everywhere I went, they were trusting. You know, they were wary, they were watchful because I was an American soldier. But when I spoke a little of the language and we hung out together, the, the villages opened up to me and saw me as an individual person more than an American soldier. And I think that's what I'm thanking them for, you know, is, and to me, that's, that's born of people who have been where they've been for 30,000 years, you know? So there's a certain security they feel in the land, which makes the violations of the land all that much more poignant. Uh, so. Well, that's a, um, um, uh, I, uh, well, wonderful sort of uh, way to kind of circle back to that original question, Stan. Thank you so much for, uh, sharing this with us and, and uh, helping us um, think through some of the your perspective there and, and uh, offering a little bit about what it was like to be on the base, um, what it was it was like to be um, uh, to be one of the Americans serving there in Okinawa during that time. I think you know one of the things that I, I really love about your book that you have talked about tonight is this. Uh, you know, things can be a lot better. It sounds so corny, but just recognizing humanity. Right in, in 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 the people around you is such a, I think a really central part of, of what I what I took away from your book. So I really encourage people to uh, to read this book. It, it as Stan said, um, uh, Okinawa is is uh, is threaded throughout much of uh, much of the the book, and it's a, it's a wonderful read. It's beautifully written. Thank you very much, Stan, for for sharing your time with us. I hope you'll stick around for the Q and A. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all for doing this. It's very moving to see. Thank you, Stan. Um, all right. Um, now, how about some music? So today, Koza uh, remains a major music town. Um, it's got a, a nice, uh, rich history uh, with music that predates, you know, that goes way back decades before, um, uh, before the uprising. Uh, so let's hear a song entitled Chijuya, and it's by uh, Wesley Winton, whom we'll learn more from later, uh, along with Francis Wong and Scott Oshido. Um, and they're playing a, a you know, a, a, a bevy of instruments, uh, a hybrid of instruments, a uh, sanshin, sax, some other things. So it really kind of reflects possibly the hybridity of Koza itself. So um, if you need to get a tea or something, let's take about five minutes, turn up your speakers, let's listen to some music. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I hope everybody had a, a good opportunity to stretch and think a, a little bit about what we've heard so far. I've been uh, really so pleased to be hearing from Kuniyoshi-san and uh, uh, Stan uh, speaking about their experiences uh, so far. We're going to take the program back to uh, Kubota-san and Kuniyoshi-san in Koza for some more uh, reflections on the night itself. So Tomoko, are you able to come back on now? Mm, yes, I can. Terrific. Can you see me? Not yet. I can see you. Okay. So, December 20th, Koza uprising happened, and I would like to see where it actually happened. So, uh, Mr. Kuniyoshi, please uh, take the floor. Okay, so we would like to see how it's, uh, uh, what it's like just now. So here, Sake Nakanomachi, here you can see, so there's like a grocery store there. And then we also have Kyoto Hotel on the street. And if you keep going straight, and then there's like a um, store. There, there's the same store that existed 50 years ago. So what was it like when you actually got here 50 years ago? So during the uprising, there's a traffic light in front of a hotel. And then I think I was there maybe 2.30 a.m., maybe 3.00. And then when I got there, a lot of cars um, had been torched, and I can see black smokes coming up. And then helicopters sort of hovering over the, the buildings uh, from the um, US Army. And then they were sort of um, um, lit up the whole area with the uh, the lights, the headlights from the helicopters to see how many people were there. And then as soon as people saw the searchlight from the helicopter, they would sort of be quiet or hide behind um, buildings or, uh, or objects. So the, the, the whole town sort of uh, it becomes still under the searchlight, but in the dark, people are just waiting for the searchlight to go away. And then uh, Mr. Kuniyoshi took some pictures in the dark. Were you using like a flashlight from the camera? Uh, yes, I used it once and then people surrounded me. And so, you know how I look like? So people thought I was a police. And I said, no, I'm a journalist from Ryukyu Shinpo newspaper. And then they told me not to use the flashlight because people didn't want um, their faces on, on um, my pictures. And then um, some people actually recognized me as um, Kazo Kuniyoshi. So they felt sort of okay because they knew that I wasn't uh, a police officer. So I took this, this was one of the first pictures I took. And then you see all the flames and then I didn't use any flashlight. I used long exposure and then um, you, you have, I can see um, you took some pictures, several pictures in the dark. So, so you had some uh, f films, film roles that you, you wasted. Um, yes, yeah, I, I, I didn't take um, pictures that, that were usable. So maybe like one third of all the pictures I took that night uh, were actually um, sort of um, good enough to develop. So here I was going down the street and then I saw another car and then you can see like a two women 
walking by the car and i use this as sort of like a with a slow exposure and then i walked i headed towards the uh, gate street and then the u.s military and then there is police there on the scene so this picture i think this was by the uh, second gate They were trying to um, block the air traffic. They had the uh, middle six and they sort of lined up, maybe 60 men lined up like a wall. And then you can see little stones on the street. And then those are from the, uh, you can see sort of like a square tiles on um, in Okinawa. They, they they have those tiles on the street, and then the people would like rip that off from the street and then break them into pieces. And then I, I'm sure it took forever to make them break them into these smaller pieces to throw. And then some people told me to throw one, and then they were kind of big. It's not like a little stone. They were they were kind of big chunk of rock. So when I went behind them, I was a little scared and worried that they might actually um, arrest me for going behind the wall, behind them, human wall, but they didn't really care about me going behind them and take pictures. So the, the Koza uprising I think the uh, the situation was getting worse in Vietnam. And then, so um, all the soldiers actually came back from Vietnam or on the way to Vietnam, they stay in Okinawa and they, they have money, they, they just get wasted, they get drunk. And then, you know, when these soldiers go into different bars and restaurants, local people who serve these soldiers don't really have positive experience with the soldiers. And then they were either bullied or abused or not treated well. So they were frustrated and stressed. And then, um, then the daylight comes in. This is early morning and then all these cars with the yellow license plates they were the um they belonged to u.s military and then back then not many local people actually owned cars but people took buses and then as you can see here in this picture there's really bad traffic jam on the street this is probably 10 a.m., I think. And then by the afternoon, um, U.S. military came to clear up the area and all of the burnt cars. And then so far, they said 80 some cars were burnt and torched, but some some um, information actually um, says it's uh, 108 cars or more. So, so I I heard there are more and more witnesses and um, other um, information coming up now after 50 years since this uh, incident. You can see this car is turned over and burnt. So there's a um, picture, next one. I think it's the next one. This is the local people, right? You can see a lot of kids, small children, young children. This was probably around noon. And then you can see the, the barricades here with the wires. 
And then some people actually smile at the camera. Yes, they're, they're smiley. Next slide. Yes, I think they were actually happy. Here, this one, this, this was the one I was talking about. This says fire on sale. And then the people are actually smiling here. What does this mean, this picture? So, yes, you can see a known Japanese person. So you can see how they dress and the hair hairstyle. You can see these are not um, uh, military people or soldiers. That's obvious. They probably came. They're probably like a tailors, maybe from India or some other countries. They they came to Okinawa to make their uh, make uh, clothes. I think he he's holding a sign um, written by possibly his Japanese wife. So a lot of um, um, known Japanese people are actually married. Um, so they're teasing this whole situation. Um, yes, yes, you can see the 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 um, the young boy to the left. He's smiling too. So people from India, they had this um, feeling that they were um, discriminated against. Um, yes, I think so. A lot of them actually married to a local lady, local uh, women. Next slide, please. And next one. This one, they look pretty tired. So these are the uh, soldiers. They were probably standing on the street guarding gate two so people wouldn't go in um, military base. And then they were probably standing there for over 12 hours or so. And they, these people have to issue visitor passes for local people, local Okinawan people, when they try to go um, in to the base, Kadena Air Force Base. So local people with ID card. Um, I, everything was burnt uh, during this uh, uprising, but I think they had to reissue their um, passes to go on the US base after the uh, uprising. So this picture, he, she probably works on the base at Kadena, and she had no clue that this happened last night, the night before. And then she got there in the morning, and then she couldn't go in. They, she weren't allowed to go in, and she didn't know what to do. And she, I, I remember she was kind of trying to figure out how to how to get to work, what to do. And then this one, uh, this is a boy walking on a car. And then I can kind of uh, picture the scene surrounding this car and the boy. So this feels like just yesterday, but it's already been 50 years since this day. And I'm so worried that I have to tell the story as long as I can, so the story doesn't fade away. Our memories don't fade away. And then it's been 50 years since then, and then there was a student from Ryukyu University who's writing about Koza uprising. And then this boy witnessed everything and then stepped on this car. And I don't think he would 
forget this day, this moment. And then I'm really hoping that this boy, this person, would share his feelings and his thoughts and his experiences from this day with people around him. So, we can share that the local people in Okinawa, Okinawans, were angry and we did something about it. And I am really hoping that I can see this person. And then I think so. Uh, all the adults around around this car, I think all the the, the men, the grown up men, they probably wanted to the adults. They probably wanted to jump on the car as well, just like this boy. But I think there's there must be this sense of relief, or maybe sort of like a pride that we were able to do this kind of sense. I that's that's the the impression I got. And then, so it's been 15, 50 years. And then in the next section, I would like to um, talk about how uh, Mr. Kuniyoshi feels about this event 50 years ago, 50 years later. Hi, everyone. So as Tomoko and Alan just mentioned, I'm Lex. I am a third year PhD student in the history department at UC Santa Cruz. And I am super excited today to be Yuntakuing with uh, Dr. Wesley Uenten, who is a professor in Asian American Studies at San Francisco. Don't order this okay. Um, Wesley, cha ganju yamisemi. Ganju yabindo. Ganju yamisemi. Ganju saimi. Um, so. One of the things I'm super excited to be talking to you about is actually we assign your book chapter about the Koza uprising uh, to our students in Okinawan history. And so one of the things that surprised me when I first, um, I stumbled upon this chapter uh, in a book, not expecting it. And so I sort of wanted to know what your first um, time learning about the Koza uprising was and what inspired you to write a whole book chapter about it. Okay, I just must warn you, uh, we have a two-year-old, so she might have her own uprising <laughs> at any time. We're in a small room in Naha. Uh, so um, anyway, going back to that article, um, and thanks for asking that question. It's an honor to be here with everyone. Um, uh, let's see, the article, uh, I, had, I had glimpses of pictures of uh, what happened in Koza um, over the years somehow. And then it didn't come together until I, a friend of mine, uh, Arakaki Makoto, who's here in Okinawa as well, he, he gave me this book about, it was a, a collection of photos of Okina, uh, of Koza around 1970. And there's all these photos of um, that December 20, night of December 20th the, and the aftermath. and uh, what happened before that um and so i i started thinking wow this is um something um uh, i've it, it kind of had a great impact on me and i think one of the reasons why i wanted to write the the article uh it started out as a paper so i i got to uc berkeley and i got into the ethnic studies phd program and i was learning about um uh, third world liberation and uh, imperialism, white supremacy, colonialism, and I was trying to uh, apply that to um, uh, the Okinawan case. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote this paper for uh, one of my classes. Um, and uh, that's where it started. Uh, what I was trying to do was uh, re uh, or sort of rewrite the narrative of what it means to be Okinawan in the diaspora, to be an Okinawan overseas. Uh, I'm Sansei Okinawan. And so um, the way we have written our narrative of what it's like to be, what it is to be Okinawan is this linear trajectory, uh, the assumption that our history is 
one of upward mobility leading to success. Um, and part of that is we will reach success if we keep our head down and don't say anything, be quiet, passive, uh, don't resist. Uh, I want, and, and feeling that narrative what, what was the small minority um, myth that exists in the U.S. Uh, regarding Asian Americans. But also when I was a kid, I watched this movie over and over. It's called The Tea House of the August Moon. And the characters in that, in that movie uh, were all these um, uh, passive and happy-go-lucky, everything's fine. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that was the portrayal of Okinawan. So um, that's one reason why I wrote the article. And right around the time, <laughs> sorry, I'm academic, so I can keep going on and on. But at the time, I met some of the Black Panthers in, uh, in Oakland. So I was at UC Berkeley, and I got to meet Black Panthers. Uh, they're, um, they're around, so I got to meet them. And, um, uh, we shared these stories. And I showed one of the um, uh, former Panthers a picture of um, the Poza Bodo and uh, pictures of uh, Teruya mm -hmm. and he he was really surprised. There was a picture of Huey Newton in there and he went, wow and he was shocked and so that's um, some of the reasons why I wrote the article. Yeah I think sort of backtracking a little to what you were saying about these persistent narratives about what it means to be diasporic Shimanchu like I, I'm also diasporic Shimanchu, I'm mixed race from San Diego. And one of the things that I think was really pervasive growing up was this like peace narrative, peaceful people, um, beautiful island, peaceful people. Um, and I don't think that has to be incorrect, but I think one of the things that the Koza uprising shows us is that there, is at least one big instance in which Okinawans just don't sit and take it anymore. And I think that's one of the big takeaways I have from your um, article in particular. And then you make it very clear throughout the chapter that the Koza uprising was an incident with a bunch of factors as we've heard, racial inflections, gendered inflections. Um, and I was wondering if you could chat a little bit um, about these other circumstances going on in Okinawa and how that causes you to call it an uprising over a riot, as we've done here as well for this event. Well, a riot assumes that people are not, um, it was a spontaneous. And um, it also kind of is when you, portrayed as a riot, um, it's, it's as if the people who are doing or partaking in the riot are animal-like. So it's in a way, it's, you know, how we portray um, um, Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. other um, uprisings in the U.S. We, uh, especially if they're uh, by people of color, we, it's, it's kind of animal-like. Um, but if you really look at them, a lot of things are happening and people are, it's been percolating for years, decades, centuries. And so in the case of Okinawa, there was a, if you go back, you can go back to 1609 um, or even further <laughs> and um, where Japan or Satsuma um, forcibly uh, colonized Okinawa. And so there, from that time, there's taxation of Okinawans and exploitation of the Ryukyu uh, China trade, um, and and then you keep um, look analyzing history. Uh, Okinawans are being oppressed and exploited over centuries. So um, I felt that all of that came together on that um, that night, um, and it's um, oppression, economic oppression, um, uh, social oppression gender oppression and the class oppression uh it all came together in that fateful night and it took a an incident <laughs> and it sparked it but um 
Yeah, there, there were a lot of things, the causes and conditions were there that it just exploded that night. So we're going to take a quick break from Wesley Shinchi and my conversation, and we'll go back to Kubota-san and Kuniyoshi-san, and then you'll hear from us again. All right, Tomoko. Is it my turn? Yes? Yes, it is, Tomoko. Okay. Good. Can you see me? Okay. Okay, so now, um, Kunio-san and I will talk about how we should think about this Koza uprising after 50 years. So I'm going to show you where I am. So I'm going to call it a virtual tour. And I hope you can, you can sort of sense, you can feel that you're walking through the town of Koza. So right now, I'm at the uh, his street. It's the um, the pro uh, pro uh, post war cultural memorial museum in Koza. And here, this um, they have um, exhibit all the um, cultural materials, pictures. You can see all the pictures here and the tools, devices. And then on the second floor, this is the um, the special exhibition here. And then they have a um, Koza uprising and the 50 years of history. And you can see the uh, big map of all the incidents where they happened and accompanying pictures. And then I am in that building. So, uh, okay, so uh, Mr. Kuniyoshi, so it's been 50 years since then. And then looking back, what kind of impact does this incident um, bring um, to the local people of Koza or people in Okinawa. I, it's, it's difficult to describe. But, so we have Japan, this is US, all these big, larger entities and organizations sort of uh, put force and sort of weight on um, the shoulders of Okinawans. And then, so uh, before there was a direct dialogue and um, conversation between Okinawa and US government or US military. So this was, was more like a direct interaction or negotiation. But now we have Japanese government in between and then I sometimes wonder myself if our voice is actually being delivered honestly and directly to the US side through the Japanese government. And then now we can talk about things that we were not supposed to talk about 50 years ago or we couldn't talk about 50 years ago. So now I think there's a change in our awareness regarding the issue or the, our, our um, stance. But throughout my life, it's 70 some years um, of the history. I think there's so many bases and then US military can actually open up new bases whenever, wherever they want in Okinawa. And then I want everyone to remember that Okinawa is not just a place for US bases or other um, sort of purposes, but we have, we live here. We're human beings living on this island in Okinawa. 
and then all these voices have been ignored and not taken up, not valued. And what I can do is take pictures. And then through my um, photographs, I can deliver my message, hopefully. And then get my message across through my uh, photographs. And then I want to participate in different events. And I want to have my own voice to speak up. I want to communicate. Um, of course, I used to work for a newspaper company. So back then I was 24. So I would go interview people, take pictures. But then this incident it's, um, itself really impacted and changed my life from that day. And then that was a really a turning point for my life as a journalist, as a person. And then here, uh, there's an event for this uh, 50 year anniversary since the uprising at the uh, Music Town. I think today is the last day of the event, but you can participate if you're interested in. And then lastly, I think um, there are a lot of students in the States participating in this event. And then um, there are a lot of people, especially younger generations, they don't know anything about this incident. Do you have any message? For these uh, young students? Yes, uh, people in my generation um, had a lot of sort of significant impact or influence from um, cultures um, in the States, from the States, music, movies, and they affected me in my life. And then, like, I don't have any sort of allergic reactions or sort of a feeling of rejection for anyone from the States. I want to get to know them. I want to talk to them more. And I want them to experience this little island. I want them to know so that how many bases we have on this tiny little island. And I we'll welcome you if you want to come visit us here. So please come and see the reality here. Thank you very much for your time uh, to uh, join us today. Thank you. And then we're going to have a, a Q&A session. And then, so I think uh, we're going to have another conversation uh, with Wesley. And then after that, we're going, we're coming back to Kuniyoshi. I can sure try. Um, so one of the things you and I have chatted about a bit, Wesley Shinji, is that we don't really learn about the Koza uprising in diaspora spaces. I grew up pretty Kenjinkai adjacent. We would go to the big Obon festival in New Year's and I went to temple school for a while, but I, I didn't learn about the Koza uprising until college. Um, did you have a similar sort of coming to you? Yes, it, I guess um, being, um, putting in the context of uh, Okinawans being colonized. Um, and one of the first things that is uh, greatly affected is language. Um, so Okinawans have, um, we, our language has been cut in a lot of ways like Native Americans and we um, uh, lost a lot of our language. And so getting messages across to the next generation is very hard and getting messages across the ocean or uh, you know, from the homeland is difficult. So we spent a lot of, we in the di diaspora, Okinawan diaspora, we spent a lot of time um, trying to train our ears to hear the voices of our other Okinawans back home and in other parts of the di diaspora. So it's a lot about voice. It's the voice of ok Okinawans. And the way I see the um, Koza uprising, um, I, I don't mean to romanticize it too much, but uh, it, it was 
um, a voice of love, uh, love for yourself. Um, it was part of the peace movement, the very, the pain of knowing that Okinawa was, was used as a staging ground from the Vietnam War and the voice of love my daughter in the background. But it was a voice of love. In, and um, we, we in the diaspora are searching or trying to amplify our voices. A lot of times we're not heard. Um, so um, uh, it is about this voice. And uh, I just want to mention we have a group called the Global Uchinancho Alliance. <laughs> so if you go on uh, Facebook or look us up, Global Uchinancho Alliance, and see the voices of uh, some of us in the uh, uh, Okinawan diaspora. I have a friend named Pete Doctor who just wrote about the Koza uh, uprising. You can look up for him. And there's also Eriko Ikihara here in Okinawa. So if you look up Koza Mixtopia, she has an event uh, on the Koza uprising. So it's today. <laughs> anyway, right. so I'm not glad to see you. Yeah, and they're both really inspirational to me as well, and citing them in my master's paper last year. Both of them ended up in there. <laughs> Um, I think on my end now, having been able to design a class about Okinawan history with Alan, Malaya, and Drew, one of the really important parts to get in there for the modern Okinawa section was about the Koza uprising. And like you were saying, it, it provides a, a voice that I at least was not aware of when I was growing up. And I think the people who talk about the Koza uprising in very real terms uh, about what it actually was, which is like a decolonial movement and the result of so many forces of colonialism for so long, are people like you and Kuniyoshi-san who are also Shimanchu. And I think that's, it feels like I wouldn't be doing my sukubun to not include these voices and this event like in teaching our students uh and so i wanted to thank you for that um did you have any final sort of words or <laughs> i could go on forever with a yuntaku but <laughs> um no maybe just the the song that francis wong and scott Oshiro and i did got to julia and so the meaning of that song is um, the diasporation, the diasporization of Okinawans made Okinawans leave Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And one of the only things that we can look, we can, being so far away from home, knowing we can't really go back to where we came from. We can look at the moon in the sky and there's only one moon and we're wondering if the other people are looking at the same moon. <laughs> so that was the meaning behind that song. Um. And with that, I think we will throw it back to Alan. Thank you, Wesley Shinji. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, all the panelists, for a fascinating discussion. We've had some great commentary in the Q&A section. People uh, are really quite moved by a lot of what has been said here. Um, and uh, a number of people have asked about uh, some of the, the uh, materials we've talked about, for example, the essay by uh, Dr. Wenten. Um, uh, which is in a book called Militarized Currents Toward a Future, uh, Decolon toward a, a Future Decolonization of Asia and the Pacific. And his essay is called Rising Up from a Sea of Discontent, the 1970 Koza Uprising in U.S. Occupied Okinawa. So that book was published in 2010. A lot of people asked about that one. Um, I'm going to start with a, a question from uh, uh, Hiramoto Noriaki. Uh, this is in Japanese, and he's got one part for Kuniyoshi-san, and he has one part for Stan. So I'll start with, uh, with um, the one for Kuniyoshi-san. Uh, Okinawa ni wa kichi mondai wa ga mada nakorotte masu. So there's a base issue in Okinawa from a lesson from the uh, Koza uprising 50 years ago. What can we use, what knowledge can we use in order to solve this base issue in Okinawa? Is there any uh, change in the relationship between U.S. military and Okinawa in this 50 years? Were you able to hear the, the question? Should I repeat it? Okay. 
Okay, yeah, uh, I can't hear you. Okay, now I can hear you. Okay, so I read the question. Okay, I'm going to read the question again. So in Okinawa, there is a, um, a base issue. And based on the lessons learned from uh, 50 years ago, Koza uprising, I think the, the sound volume is really low. I can't really. Were you able to hear my question, Kubota san? So we still have the issue um, of US base in Okinawa, but did we is there any um, lesson that we learned from 50 years ago from Koza uprising that we can use in order to solve the issue? Okay, is this my turn? Yes, go ahead. I'll wait. Should I wait? Okay, now, okay. So, the base issue. So there are so many views and viewpoints for the past 70 years. Okay, the easiest solution is U.S. military leaves the base, leaves Okinawa. And that's the best. But because of the diplomatic issue with China, Korea, South Korea, North Korea, U.S. military decides to stay in Japan. And then, of course, you can see here. So, if you're talking to locals in Okinawa, I would say all these bases should go to other places in Tokyo, like Tokyo, Osaka, other cities, not in Okinawa. And this is such a small island. And then we have 70% of US military bases of all Japan on this island. It's just so, it's, they're all concentrated in here. So I want to tell all Japanese people that they should take over and then they, they, they should be responsible in hosting US bases instead of us doing, doing it all. And that's my view. But yes, okay, let me be really honest. No, I'm not anti-US. I am anti-military. So that the 70 years, close to 80 years of impact the US military bases um, gave to the local people of Okinawa and Okinawa, the land of Okinawa, we can't, it's unimaginable, unbelievable. So now I see how Japanese governments work, how US governments work. And then, and then the diplomatic issues, you can, you can see how, how they work with, with each other. There are so many things I want to talk about, but here in this, book called stand this is how i feel this rep represents my thoughts uh, there's another question from hiramoto san this time for stan and uh, it's in japanese but stan i'm going to translate it uh, on the fly for you okay thank you so hiramoto san says uh not many japanese have learned about the pain of the american soldiers at, from that time and so uh, Hiramoto-san believes this is a very valuable testimony that you've given today. And uh, he would like to know that um, there's a term bundan, which means you know, the separation of, of Okinawa and America in terms of the, the rule by America. So wondering, um, 
what do you think has changed in the 50 years since the end of American rule in uh, Okinawa? Do you have any sense of that? You mean on Okinawa itself? Either in Okinawa or uh, even for yourself, if you reflect on the end of American rule uh, short, you know, in, in the early 1970s, what do you think might uh, be the, um, the, the effect in, in Okinawa? Hey, hey. It's hard. Um, it's hard for me to say uh, what that effect is on Okinawa because I have not been back. I worked with Okinawan people in Hawaii when I was uh, working and living there. So I have some pictures of it uh, specific to Okinawa. But in the, in the 60 years since I've been there, I think we have a much a uh, greater, deeper, broader opportunity to see the effects of colonialism, of U.S. colonialism worldwide, and where this is affecting uh, the entire planet uh, right now is really important. I think Okinawa represents for me a kind of a, macro a microcosm of where militarism uh, does damage to everything, to, uh, to people's spirits, to the land itself, to where people's spirits are completely interconnected with the land itself. Um, so I, I see huge changes in the last uh, 60 years. I also see at the same time a stasis, a uh, a way in which people are refusing to see the obligations of being a human being. And I, you know, as I was listening to everything here, I completely celebrate the COSA uprising. I think it was as the uh, indigenous people of Chiapas said, basta which is enough, okay? So I see that as that, as, as a very strong resistance that I think should be studied. People should see this. At the same time, for me, as a native person, as an indigenous man, everything I experienced from the Okinawans when I was there, 63 to 65, were very defiant acts of resistance. I don't see the resistance of Okinawans from my experience as solely being confined to that event. I think that's a beautiful symbol of it. But when I was chased out of that hotel because I was an American, that's an act of resistance. I did nothing personally to deserve that, but I was part of a body of people who were occupying that land. I was, I knew nothing of it. I was 19 years old. I was just beginning to wake up to all this stuff. Uh, when the people in Nago hit me, what the Okinawan men coming in searching to beat up Americans was doing was an act of resistance. And the insistence upon maintaining the vision of life and community, the sense of community was so powerful where I lived on Okinawa and with the people that I met and the openness. Uh, to me, that's an act of resistance because colonial powers want to stifle your relationship to life. They want to make you believe that life is a certain thing. And that certain thing usually involves violence and despair and fatalism. And to me, the act of resistance that I got from the people of Okinawa, which is why I thank them today, was to not bow down to that fatalism, but to keep believing it's life, in life as they had seen it for thousands of years. Thank you, Stan. That's also partly a, an answer to a question from Takashi Mizuno about uh, whether you viewed Okinawans as indigenous people when you lived there in the 1960s. 
I did not. I viewed them as Asian people. Uh, but like I say, I, I barely got out of high school. So, and then I was in the military. So I had no real education on these issues. What I did know, as soon as I started moving into the community, there was one old man in particular who took me under his wing and he was exactly like my grandfather. So I couldn't give the words to it, but I knew that he was family, you know? He saw the world the same way my grandfather did. Yeah. So the answer is yes and no, not in terms of articulation, but in terms of the heart, absolutely. Absolutely. I felt very much at home. Thank you. Very much at home. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Let me let me move to another question. This one is uh, we're, we're there's there's so many questions coming in and and, uh, and they're all really wonderful. Um, let me move to one that uh, Jim Ferris asked, and I'm just going to sort of paraphrase it a little bit. But I wonder if if anybody uh, participating, anybody anybody um, on our panel, uh, could talk a little bit about the ways in which Okinawa, uh, sorry, Koza, as a base town, differs or shares similarities with what we know of as other base towns. You know, I imagine a lot of people listening are familiar with. A base town somewhere, right? We have base towns in the U.S. There are base towns. Um, we don't really call them necessarily base towns in the U.S. Lex, I know you. You're from San Diego, which, you know, I would call a base town. And uh, and so, I think that um, uh, I would just be curious that maybe we could we could think of Jim's question of of of, you know, uh, what that sort of base town differs or how it looks similar to what what Coza was and maybe what what Coza is today. There wasn't anybody in particular. If we have nothing for that, we, we could uh, move on and maybe come back to that a little bit later. Um, I, this is a question that might be best answered by Kuniyoshi-san. Uh, and uh, this is in English, so I'll, I'll ask that it be translated. Uh, one of our visitors asks, were COSA police officers reluctant to defend American uh, or the Americans or US military property? Were the police sentimental to the uprisers or did they show brutality? Um, and considering the uprising from the position of COSA's law enforcers, do we see any parallels to police in the USA today? You know, this could be for Kuniyoshi-san and maybe perhaps even Stan or, or Wesley. So, I was there at 2 a.m. in the morning. And then when we have an incident like that scale, we have a special force from a police force. But that day, that morning, that morning, they didn't come to the public space any anywhere at the second um, gate or Moromizato area. They didn't show up. So total four to five thousand people were on the street that night, that morning. But the special force they they didn't really control us they didn't really regulate any any of the behavior they were maybe um they were trying to sort of reduce the violence if it's extreme so only for extreme cases well so i'll, I'll ask another one this comes from jane lynn and this may be kuniyoshi san again is there a is there a possibility that another uprising of this magnitude could take place in Okinawa today? What would be the mitigating factors uh, if, it, if it did, such as continued military presence or mistreatment of the locals? Or if not, what would the current deterrence be to prevent this kind of uprising from happening again? So this is my personal opinion, 
but in uh, Kamsar, uh, in Nago city, they use a landfill to use a really beautiful, pristine beach for marines. And then Japanese government supports this. And then Okinawa people actually went against this, didn't like this idea at all, even before this project started. And then 1964, US military, US government actually wanted to push forward, but now Japanese government wants to see it through. So the, the amount of money that they're going to use to destroy this beautiful beach, coral reefs, why is it necessary for them to do this? So it, in order to st stop, stopping that might be the one of the paths that we can avoid having a uprising or incident at the uh, causal level. It's probably impossible to, to, to solve these issues without actually asking US military to, to move away, retreat from Okinawa Island. So in Okinawa, if we have any issues, there's always something basolated, fences, for US military. And then all these projects that kill our marine environment. I think if we can stop this, I think the situation on this island will change dramatically. Uh, we have a, 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 another person uh, uh, born in, uh, raised in Koza who uh, would really like us to return to a conversation about the conditions of these uh, uh, bases in other places than Okinawa, so far as we know. Uh, and, and, and again, the, particularly the base town and base relationships. Um, and I know Dustin, this is also uh, uh, an area of research for you, but uh, Wesley or uh, Stan or, or Kuniyoshi-san, if anybody else would like to, to uh, provide a little uh, information for uh, Takamine, Takamine Miwako. Oh. Takamine? I, yeah. I could just, you know, just thinking about this question of, of base towns, you know, and knowing what we know about Koza then and knowing what we know about Koza now, you know, I think that it, there, those sorts of conditions were not necessarily unique to Koza, you know, and, and this reminds me of another question that came up about, um, you know, looking at the, the, the racial dynamic of the riot, of the uprising uh, itself in that, you know, in particular, it was uh, white servicemen who were targeted or whose cars were targeted and black servicemen were um, not targeted in that, in that same way. And that was a recognition that, you know, a town like Koza, um, as an American based town, right? It's an Okinawan community, but it was outside of an American base. Uh, that, you know, along with American exports of, of commodities and, and music cultures and things like that, you also exported American style racism. And so within Koza itself, the, the, the town was segregated um, so that you had, right, um, establishments, bars and eateries and, and mm. in, in neighborhoods that were segregated um, and patrolled by MPs to keep that segregation in place for black soldiers in one area and, and white soldiers in another area. And that's something that you see in, in other parts of, of Japan, at least, and other places you think of, uh, you know, if you go into Western Tokyo, for example, Western Tokyo um, is a place that historically had a, a huge amount of military bases, right? Today, there's still Kadena, uh, sorry, um, Yokota Air Force Base is in Western Tokyo. Uh, Tachikawa Air Force Base used to be a, another major installation there. Um, but there are a, a, a lot of military bases in that, in that area. And a lot of those air those towns and those, those base towns that grew up around those bases um, or those sort of uh, um, entertainment districts uh, had a similar kind of racial dynamic um, that you saw in, in Koza. So, you know, Koza in some ways was, was not um, 
unique in, in, in perhaps in, in some parts of, in some ways of thinking about what its base town element was like. But of course, you know, as, as Stan has been talking about and, and other folks have been talking about, you put into that mix Okinawa's separation and distinction from mainland Japan and the, hist the history of Okinawans being, um, uh, you know, uh, set aside from, from uh, mainland policies, uh, uh, mainland sort of uh, rights and, and uh, uh, legal rights, um, then you get a, a sort of a, a different dynamic so that Okinawans bear the brunt of, of uh, occupation and base towns look a little bit But other people can um, that as well, these other, you know, other base towns. I had a question for Tomoko, but I'm going to wait to make sure that Tomoko is able to hear it. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask. Um, I see Lex is. Uh, oh, Lex, go ahead. Say, why don't you add something, please? Yeah, I just had a little something to add on to what Dustin was saying about base towns. And it wasn't until I moved to Santa Cruz that I realized how heavily militarized San Diego is. And it's a very like it was normal growing up to not question why we have Camp Pendleton and Miramar and 32nd Street all in one place. And we are like a US city, so it makes more sense. But the reason I grew up in San Diego is not just like this random thing. My grandpa was, um, the last base he was stationed at was Camp Pendleton. And so I grew up next to Camp Pendleton until I was seven. And then we moved uh, to South Bay and like, I grew up with base access my whole life and didn't think twice about it. It wasn't until I started thinking more deeply about militarism not being this normal thing. And especially when I took Dustin's Okinawan history class in college, realizing that for a lot of diasporic Shimanchus like myself, like. I, I exist because of the military bases. And so it is this really weird cognitive dissonance that goes on. But because of that, there's a reason I also grew up with a lot of mixed race Okinawan people in my high school and uh, in my temple school. And I think that element of base townness is seen really, really, really in particular when you talk about uh, comparing places in the U.S. with places like Koza. Oh, thank in you. This, in this conversation, I'm thinking of the campus that Dustin teaches on. Uh, CSU Monterey Bay is where I went through basic training in 1962. And Seaside was complete base town at the time very much divided between blacks and whites. Now, I wanna point out that too on Okinawa, at least in my barracks, when you say blacks and whites, you have a whole lot of Latino and Asian and native folks in there too. And they were all part of the white contingent. So the blacks were completely separated off. Uh, and everybody else, including folks from Hawaii that I served with, all referred to, or not all, not all, I don't want to over categorize here by any extent of the imagination, but to say that the black areas were called the bush or the jungle. And so you get that whole uh, a kind of connotation that Dustin's talking about being reinforced by the MPs. You know, it wasn't that much different right down the road from us here uh, in a certain sense. It's, of course, it's very different because it's colonized. It's, it's right after World War II. You've got a whole nother dynamic. But what uh, what this brought up for me when Kuniyoshi-san said, uh, let's move these bases to outside of Tokyo. Let's uh, spread the, spread the uh, military out. Why is it focused all on one island? And for me as an indigenous person, 
this may this raises the question of, of possible racism within Japan towards indigenous people on Okinawa and how that then feeds into keeping uh, Okinawa not only an American colony, but a Japanese colony as well. So I think these are important questions to ask. You know, we see them here. And when Kuniyoshi san said that, spread it out, I thought about, okay, what has happened to Fort Ord, which is one of the major bases here with this whole base town, with the black white dynamic, the racism, the classism, all of it, the gender issues, the rapes, everything that's part of that. Here, it's now a university, okay? So what could be done? on Okinawa with that land, right? Here you have this gentleman, Dustin, uh, teaching right down the street here in what used to be the bastion of militarism in our area. So I like Kuniyoshi-san's idea because it opens the imagination to what is possible. And again, that comes back to that is Keeping the imagination open to what is possible is an act of resistance. That is really, really important. I want to emphasize that. So, thank you. Kuniyoshi-san, do you have anything you would like to add? Nanika, the last word is gozaimasen de So, in his remark, Since I, I've been here in Koza since high school, and then there was a sort of a, I I was walking through this area called uh, Black um, Area Black Street, and when I was a little kid, there was a, a team only with African American soldiers, and the commander was a uh, Caucasian American. And then near the Okinawa city uh, hall, there was this area, a uh, fenced area. And then there were some uh, black soldiers, African-American soldiers there stationed. And then on my commute to school and home, I think over so there's there was always this, I, I think we call it like a bush, but maybe like, you know, when there's Caucasian soldiers, it's sort of mix in the, in the group, there's conflicts, there's fights. So there were a lot of people, known Japanese people coming to Okinawa for work back then. So in my elementary school, junior high, high school. So, so there's always a classmate, uh, African-American dad or Caucasian-American dad in my class. But for us, it wasn't really like a special thing that, you know, one of our classmates has a known Japanese dad. And then it's been 75 years since uh, U.S. military control in Okinawa. But uh, that if there's a child, you know, who was born, then you know uh, we call them like a mixed baby. But uh, we we have you know, those baby is now seventy five years old, and the next generation is out my generation. So if it's it's just countless cases of these uh, mixed race uh, children grow grew up in Okinawa. So, because we were sort of exposed to different um, races on this island, we don't really have any uh, uh, strong reaction to known Japanese locals in this area. Opening conversation, and particularly uh, the the perspectives that we've been able to hear from tonight are ones that we don't often get to hear from at the same time. Uh, and so, 
for me, the sense of dialogue between everybody here has been very powerful. And I'm very grateful to all of our, our speakers today, both our special guests and to our, our uh, Okinawa Memories Initiative team members. Um, it's been fantastic. Our Q&A has just a, a treasure of, of fascinating questions and comments. And we are not going to be able to get to all of them, but I believe uh, that our plan is, uh, since we, we are able to save these questions, we will be posting uh, this video on our website, okinawamemories.org. Uh, and uh, we will include in that posting, uh, both uh, the pictures that Kuniyoshi-san uh, took that he has given us permission to show everybody. Uh, and we will include the, the, some of the questions and the answers that we've gotten today. And I will share uh, the, the uh, comments and questions, particularly with the panelists uh, to whom they were directed. So, um, I, I think that uh, I, I've, I've called on everybody's uh, good time uh, for quite enough now. And so I'm going to say thank you every, very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, Lex, would you like to say it in Shimakutaba properly? Yeah, there we do. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, Kubota-san, thank you as well. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, end the program. Uh, you know, with uh, with one more tune by uh, Wesley Wenten and and his friends Francis Wong and Scott Oshiro. So, uh, if you'd like to have a listen to a song called Toshindoi, uh, as as we fade out, thank uh, you. Tos, very much. Yeah. Uh -huh.